Scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 12. Isaiah chapter 40, 9 through 12. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mount, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Good morning, everyone. I mentioned Bible class. It's good to be back with you. It is. It's, uh, we had a, had a good, uh, good visit. We had a good trip. It was a very long trip. We started out uh, pretty excited. It looked more like, kind of like that. You know, pretty optimistic. But that, the whole trip takes about 25 hours or so. So as you get to the end of that, you start looking a little bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, it just about sp- It takes a while to recover from that. (laughs) Yeah. We uh, we did have a, we had a good, but it's good to be home. But it was really good to see Silas and to spend some time with him again. And uh, uh, he has a a girlfriend now. Her name is Aya. She's a Japanese girl. And uh, she speaks uh, some English, uh, some pretty good. She struggles with some pronunciations. But we, Maddie and I noticed that there were a few words that she says very well, pronounces very well, and it's usually when Silas is driving and it is, uh, slow down, be careful, those are the words she's mastered, those are the ones she's mastered, so I told him, <laughs> I told him, I said, now that's a sign, so I need him. And I was a good, it was a good visit, and uh, while we traveled, and this is what I usually do anywhere I fly, uh, I remember uh a long time ago, the first time I had flown, and I, I thought a lot about it. it, it I, I looked for God and everything, and you know, I remember the first time I was above the clouds. I'd seen pictures of that. I'd never done it myself before prior to that point, and uh, and I thought about how how amazing that is. And at one point, the plane would turn. You'd be you know usually the cruising altitudes about thirty thirty five thousand feet, something like that. And uh, there was one point when it was really gray above. There wasn't any more blue, and I thought, I wonder how high we are <laughs> exactly, you know. Uh, but I, I kept thinking about uh, Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended back to heaven, and it says a cloud received him out of the side of the apostles, and I remember thinking of, uh, you know, I'm seeing something that the apostles wouldn't have even got to see as far as that, that level of height, you know, and uh, it's just really hard for me not to think about God like 24-7 at that point. I mean, I'm, he's on my mind every time I look out the window. Every time there's turbulence, I think of God. <laughs> And then when, uh, wherever you go to your destination, you, you realize that, uh, you know, God wasn't just the God of, of me when I was in Fredericktown, Ohio, and it's not just the God of those who live in America, that he's, he's everywhere, and, and uh, I could see God everywhere in Japan, and it was uh, it's just an amazing thing. And the more I thought about it, I uh, kept thinking of that song that was written by, I think it was a Native American Indian during World War II, he wrote down the lyrics of it, and and uh, was deployed, and I, as I understand it, he left it in his, his locker or something like that, and someone found it and actually finished it uh, or, or submitted it to a radio station, and they began to, somebody played it, and they and, and became a very popular song, and it's actually sung in a lot of churches, like uh, with kids' classes and stuff, but uh, he's got the wor- whole world in his hands, and uh, it's very simple, just four, four verses, he's got the whole world in his hands, and and uh, he's got uh, the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the moon and the stars in his hand. I think I got those backwards. And then the last is he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. And, and uh, but I thought a lot about that. I thought he does have the whole world in his hands. There is no place you can go that God is not there. And I thought maybe I would uh, uh, bring a lesson along those lines and, and uh, we could uh, focus a little bit on the uh, omnipresence of God today. Even as, even as we stepped off the, the plane at the, the very last of it, or even the, to stay in the hotel and you know the, see the ocean and all that, and I just felt the very presence of God. And that was the first thing I thought of, is that 
you know, I, I know he was there. It wasn't like I didn't think he'd be there. You know, it, it's not like after you get it, you go so far away that suddenly, you know, God, this is a godless place. Even a place that we view as 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 uh, godless places that uh, seem to be devoid of God. It's either used in one of two ways. It's either the t- the terrain. Uh, the way things look is really horrid. It looks dead or it looks like a desert or something. Or it's uh, God forsaken in the sense that the people who live there might be foul, vile, and there isn't any semblance of morality among them. But it doesn't mean that God is not there because even in a foreign land, God is there. It doesn't make a difference where one dwells, wherever men inhabit the earth, God is there. A person can become a child of God. They can obey the gospel. And no matter in what dispensation of time you live, what continent or island you live on, wherever men inhabit the earth, you are, if you obey the gospel, you are belonging to and a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And I thought about that too because, uh, you know, America is, is viewed as a Christian nation, although sometimes we wonder anymore how is that? As, uh, as it seems like in so many ways it doesn't it doesn't measure up to that in our in our estimate of things but uh, uh, certainly in, in foreign lands to a large degree they would there are a lot of places are not considered Christian nations Japan's not a Christian nation they're not a you know I don't see there's a, there's much morality immorality there as there is uh, in other places there's a lot of good there as well I didn't say anything that overly shocked me you know but uh, as, as a country goes, it's not one that's considered to be a Christian nation. And I thought, here I am a Christian in this place. And I wonder, uh, in terms of my son or myself or Maddie, in just a few weeks that we were there, what could, could we do to maybe even uh, let our light shine enough to maybe interest somebody in, in Jesus Christ? And uh, but I just think about that. I, I think about how many times that people might have even thought that they could escape from God by leaving a place they thought was, this is where God is, you know. God is the God of Israel, right? He's the God of Palestine. And so uh, Jonah found out uh, rather the hard way that you can't run away from God because he's everywhere. In Jonah's chapter 1 and verses 4 through 9, it uh, makes it very clear as he had fled. And it was basically not, you know, in the context, he wasn't really running away like he thought he could escape God as much. He wanted to escape the duties God put upon him. He was just going to go defiantly in a different direction. And God caused a great storm to arise upon the Mediterranean Sea. And it was to the degree that the ship was going to be swallowed up and that the, uh, the mariners on board were praying each to their own gods and they were casting lots. Whose fault is this? They were very superstitious people. And they wanted to know, it's got to be the fault of somebody on the boat. Well, as it turns out, this time it really was. <laughs> It really was. Ordinarily, I'd say, just leave it in the realm of uh, superstition. But in this particular case, it turns out, though they were superstitious, it turns out it was because of a guy on the boat, Jonah. And uh, you know the story. He was cast overboard in the sea, had a great calm to that. You cannot escape from God. He is everywhere. I also think, uh, like in Psalm 137, in verses 1 and 2, if you, uh, if you consider that passage with me, Psalm 137 And verses 1 and 2. This is the occasion in which Judah had gone into Babylonian captivity. Now, geographically, as you look at a map of the world, that's not really that far away from where they originally were. Palestine and where they'd have been in Babylon was on the same map, essentially. But for them, it was, it was, they might as well have been on the moon. They were so far removed from the land of God and the house of God that had been destroyed and here they were taken captive and they had they were godless in this case. Here's a third way of godless in which God gave up on them because of their sins. Well, not really. He punished them, but he didn't give up on them, did he? How many prophecies were written that were forward-looking to the time of Christ, of course, and some of which even looked forward to the end of time, but to a large degree, it was written for them and their, their benefit, that God actually was punishing them. He wanted them to go. He's willing to do that, though. He's willing to, to take away the things that were a memory and remembrance of, of Him to them. The house was destroyed. He allowed it to be destroyed. It was completely laid waste to the ground. It was, uh, the articles of the temple were taken away. Those precious things that God says do not touch for they are holy. But he allowed the Babylonians to handle them and fondle them and, and, and take them away. And they didn't die. The command was given to the people of God. And here they were taken wave after wave into captivity into a strange land. And there was a time, it seems, that there were, there were those in which, while they were there, that they might have been mocked, you know, as this passage seems to indicate, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. 
Uh, and it goes on to say that they demanded a song of them. Sing us a song. Sing us a song of those songs back in Zion. And he said, how can we sing the songs of God in a foreign land? They felt completely isolated from God. But God was actually there. It didn't make a difference where they had been taken. What if, what if their captivity had been uh, to cross a great sea and maybe in a, someplace on the other side of the globe? Would God not be? He was there with his people. Ezekiel the prophet, he tells Ezekiel a number of things. He makes, he says, I've made you watch over the house of Israel while you're there. He was there in captivity with them in that foreign land. And he said, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears and go get the captives to the children of your people and speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord, Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. He, he, he tells them, he, he's right there. He's with Ezekiel. He's one of the prophets. No, he wasn't the only one. He was one of the prophets to the captives of the people. There was a man of God in the midst and God was with the man of God. At the very least, God was there. At the very least, God was there because of the man of God. God's with one of you, with one person. In your midst, God is there. But it also indicates, if you go on and read uh, just a little bit further, if you, if you have your Bible open to that passage, I don't have it on the chart uh, here. But it goes on to say in the next verse, Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice, Blessed is the glory of the Lord from the, His place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels beside them and a great thunderous noise. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to the captives at Tel Abib who dwelt by the river Kibar and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. The river Kibar is a river in Babylon that the Spirit deposited him there in this miraculous vision. The Spirit was there. God was there. God is there. It doesn't make a difference where we are. And uh, while this is a the storyline we're reading here is a very sad story. I mean, I can tell you, I didn't experience anything like captivity in Babylon for two weeks, you know. But it does go to show God is everywhere. In good or bad times, God is everywhere. And speaking of bad times, it, uh, you know, I... In, this, in today's age, modern technology, the ability, you know, they actually have Wi-Fi over there, and I'm able to get on the little news snippets, you know, as I forget some generic news, I don't know where they come from, I think it's a, a combination and culmination of, of uh, people who are write for various newspapers, and then, uh, you know, I've got a little CNN app, and a little Fox News app, I figure if I look at both of them, the truth's right in the middle somewhere, <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm looking at it, and all I'm seeing is, oh, Oh, we might be going to war. Trump takes out a general. Real bad guy, evidently, really needed to go, according to the, the, the ideas of be evil people and the harm that they do to other people. And you know, you view, view this guy as a guy that was uh, more important to take out than even bin Laden. That's saying a lot, if that's true. Well, then, that's about three days later, after there's a lot of, a lot of marching and you know, three days of grieving for General Salami or whatever his name was, I can't remember his name now. Um, he, uh, then they, uh, they fired the, what, 15 ballistic missiles back. I'm like, well, boy, that's, that's not good. They, they, Iran fires some missiles on a U.S. installation and, you know, from Iran. That's unusual. So everybody's sweating it out. Troops are being deployed still. But what's Trump going to do? How's he going to respond? Everybody's talking about World War III. And so... So far to this point, it hasn't escalated any further. There's a lot of bad things that have happened in Iran, I've noticed. They've actually evidently admitted to shooting down an airline that killed 167 people or something like that. There's an earthquake that happened in Iran since then. I don't know if it has anything to do with anything, but a lot of bad things started happening in Iran. And one thing I know is there's all this turmoil in the world right now, a lot of fear. And parents and grandparents and friends and loved ones are, are very prayerful right now because uh, it's getting pretty hot over there. Things are getting pretty tight and intense, more so than ever before. But yet, God is there. You don't think, no, God isn't causing this. This is stuff man's doing. You don't think God is there? God's everywhere. Even where there's a threat of war, God is there. There are times people have prayed to God that they would, uh, that He would spare their, their uh, friends or loved ones from any harm in battle and 
Sometimes they came home safe. Sometimes they came home with a few less limbs, and sometimes they didn't come home at all. And there's all kinds of reactions to that, the way people are toward God, especially if you've lost someone. And they knew that God's powerful. Why didn't He prevent that? Why didn't He... You know, there's, a, there's a lot of questions that people ask. It doesn't change the fact that God knows. He sees all, knows all. He is everywhere at the same time. There's a lot of things that God uh, permits to happen, allows to happen. He allows humanity to play out. He does answer prayers. Sometimes He answers prayers in ways that we don't even expect Him to. Sometimes it's even greater than we thought. Sometimes it just isn't answered the way we want it to be answered. It doesn't change the fact that God hasn't left the building. He has, he's still there. He is still everywhere. He still holds the earth in the palm of His hand. Sometimes things happen and we realize it's a test of our faith. There's all kinds of bad things that happen in the world. But one thing I know is that regardless, come what may, no matter how much I might be concerned, even as a parent, or no matter, no matter if I'm concerned just as a citizen of a particular nation, God never ceases to be. And God still holds tomorrow in His hand. Because He lives, as we sang, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future, life is worth the living because I know He lives. God is and ever shall be. And He holds all of it in the power of his grip, even in the threat of war. I've often thought about 2 Kings chapter 6 and verses 1 through 17. I don't have this up on the chart here. I debated whether to even read it because it's kind of not really uh, apples to apples to the life that we uh, live, but it, it does, it stands out to me. This was the occasion on which uh, you have the Elisha the prophet and, uh, and you have this uh, the enemy bearing down on them and they're going to overtake him, surrounding the prophet and his uh, his uh, sidekick, if you will, he's surrounding them uh, when they found out where he was in Dothan. They, he's going to surround him, and, and uh, what are we going to do? We have, we're have we completely surrounded. What are we going to do? And God prays, or uh, Elisha prays to God that the eye, eyes of his servant would uh, be open and he could see what was there. He says, uh, who's with us is mightier than who's with them, basically. we got a bigger army than they do. But he couldn't see it. So God allowed him actually to see what was happening. And behind the scenes, basically filling the entire countryside all around were basically the chariots of the army of the Lord, the angels that would have fought for him. And I, I, that always stands out to me as I think about that. If God is for us, who can be against us? And, and uh, while I know a lot of times we view that, uh, people try to use that as a national battle cry. I'm thinking personally, because it is personal, if God is for us Christians as we live for Christ, no matter what, come what may, who can be against us? And, and when Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 10, there's some things that could happen at which we lose. We might even lose our very lives, but nobody can take your soul away from God. Even in the threat of war, God is there. And speaking of the idea, this isn't about war, but there's times in which there, there are times that the children of God are oppressed, but even at that time, even at that time, God is there. Uh, there are some, uh, some th specific things mentioned in Exodus chapter 3 that I think about the, the people of God. The Hebrews were in, in uh, Egyptian captivity. And it might have seemed for you know, over four centuries that maybe God had forgotten about these people, but He never did forget about them. He prophesied they'd be in captivity that long. He didn't, he didn't just let it happen and then just kind of walk away. He has always known about them. In fact, to the degree that when he talks to Moses, he says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because their taskmasters, because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I have seen, I have heard, I know. And that's the same truth no matter what the predicament of life is, even if it's not a mighty nation of us in captivity somewhere, but whatever the oppression seems to be in our lives. The oppression might even be a thing. It could be a disease. It could be a sickness. It could be loss of a job or something. There's all kinds of things that can oppress the righteous. But one thing we should always understand, always know, is that God sees and He hears your cries, and He knows your predicament. That's a very intimate idea. He knows personally 
about that. And uh, I think, too, that's why it's so important when you, you begin to realize that you should expect adversity in your life. That's what, that's what Jesus had gone through. He says, essentially, if I'm going to suffer, my disciples are going to suffer. You should expect that. Paul talks about the Spirit bearing witness, the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, he says, if indeed we suffer with Him. That's the condition upon which we will gain the inheritance. So we're expected to suffer? Because that sounds like it's a guarantee we're going to. They're not that you might, but that you're going to. But it's what he says. He says, if indeed we suffer with Him, we are going to receive the inheritance. So on what level will that be? I don't know. We don't go out of our way to, to cause trouble. We certainly don't want to look for trouble, right? But sometimes trouble comes to us. Sometimes the hardship comes to us. Sometimes the oppressive nature of Satan, it bears down upon us, and God allows that to happen at times. And maybe it might just be, like I said a moment ago, a testing of our faith. One thing I do know is the Apostle Paul understood the value in suffering. He didn't see it as a lot of people look at it like, God must be against me. I mean, I, I, I have nothing but trouble going on in my life. And I mean, I'm trying to live a righteous life. I'm trying to, to do it right. I'm trying to live in a way that would be pleasing to Him. And so instead of the blessing, it seems like there's a lot of curse going on. And people start really questioning that. Some people have walked away from the faith because of that. Because they've just determined in their mind, and maybe they even heard it from somebody else, Satan preaching his little gospel. And they've decided, maybe there is no God. Maybe if He is a God, He doesn't like me. So if He doesn't like me, then I'm not going to like Him either. And they walk away. Paul didn't respond that way. He understood that to be, a, to be a righteous person, that you should expect to suffer. You should expect to go through some hardship. And that to do so is part of the process of going through the crucible, as it were, to burn out the impurities of your life so that you'll be pure as gold. Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He understood that. And while there's more, he said in Romans chapter 8, a passage that uh, I think most of you know is one of my favorite passages, is Romans chapter 8 at the end of the chapter. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or peril or nakedness or peril or sword? When any of these things, and I've often thought, I used to just kind of read that or quote that, and then you get down to, you know, I like to occasionally look at what do words mean and why are they in here at all, and is there a rhyme and reason to the way they're laid out in the verse, and, and you begin to just look at this, and it doesn't necessarily matter, I suppose, in what order that these words are in there, but they all are something significant. Tribulation and distress and persecution, fame and nakedness, peril and sword, that comes from every angle of life. Sword, also the idea that you could possibly be executed for the cause of Christ. Famine, famine, you might suffer in such a way that it just uh, the world about you, it's not anything anybody is doing, it's not any one person, it's not a nation that's oppressing you. Famine, that's just, that's just your tough luck. The weather's really bad, it's been bad for a long time, it hadn't rained for a while, for whatever reason. There's all kinds of things that could challenge your faith. All kinds of things that could cause you, you know, Satan's trying to cause you to turn your back on God. He wants you to believe that God's not there anymore. That God is ignoring you. That He has completely uh, left the building, as it were. But what was it Paul, Paul's conclusion? He says, who, who can separate us from the love of God? And then talks about things, essentially. There is no one and no thing, no event, no circumstance no matter where you live or what time, dispensation of time you live in, none of these things can, can separate you from God. He says, as it is written, he talks about the idea of suffering again. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's our outlook. Yeah. That's the outlook. A lot of people, would they scoff at this. But all he's doing is he's pointing this out. He quotes a passage of Scripture here, but it's just a fulfillment of this idea, is that uh, we are... We are basically a sacrifice to God. And Paul would say a couple chapters later that we're to be a living sacrifice by choice. Therefore, my beloved brethren, one of those statements again. Because of these things, my beloved brethren, present your bodies a holy sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to God. He goes on to say, proving what is the will of God in the next verse. 
He says, uh, and yet in all these things, all the, all the hardship, all these things, talking about tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and sword, and all these things, we're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very powerful. What would be the point of giving such a message here? If oppression were not part of being a Christian, being a child of God, time of some kind of suffering in some capacity, responding to it the right way is when the blessings come. That's the idea. And so we need to view this on a kind of on a bigger scale because the world isn't all about us. There's a lot more to the world than us. God, if He holds the whole world in His hand, and He is everywhere all the time, and no matter where you are, you can try to hide from God, you can. I mean, it was even stated in the prophecies like in Revelation, there would be those, when the judgment of the Lord would come, that they would say to the mountains, fall upon us, cover us up. No, you can't hide from God. It's not. What, what would that do? The judgment of God is still coming upon you to those people. I think Paul's making it pretty clear that even when we're oppressed, God is there. And to be honest with you, if we respond to that the right way, God is there in a big way. We are never really alone then, are we? And honestly, uh, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, flying and, you know, get up there above the clouds and things like that. We were there, went to a, a place that was down in some caverns called Okinawa World. And you get down to the end of these caverns. And uh, I got some pictures. That's kind of neat. And I'd never been underground before. There's a lot of caves and stuff in Ohio and Kentucky. And I think a lot of you have probably gone to these things. I know uh, Beck has and her family and all that. But I'd never done that sort of thing. Never really interested me, to be honest with you. It's like, I don't want to go underground. I like being above ground. <laughs> but I must admit, it's pretty neat. The only thing I can tell you is as soon as we entered the, entered the, uh, the chamber to go down, 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 the air became really heavy and humid. It was weird. It was a complete... Drastic difference. And I was down there enough, and then there's just a whole bunch of people, and they're just herding you along, and it's like, there's a lot of people in here, you know? And uh, I could see how people could get claustrophobic, you know? But it was kind of neat. But the point of this is not just to tell you about how fun, what kind of fun we had, or things that we saw, but, you know, whether I was in a plane above the clouds or I was down below the earth, it's like, I kept thinking of God. God's there. Everywhere that I go, He is there. And uh, I guess that was the, the reason I came up with this final point, whether high or low, God is there. There is uh, no place that the presence of God cannot be felt and understood. In Job 26 and verse 6, Job says, Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering. Talking about the, the grave, uh, the spirit grave essentially. Same as Hades in the New Testament. What's he saying? There is, n even in that state, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're walking around in a physical body, but we have a spirit inside of this. And when we die, our spirit leaves our body, just as Jesus has did in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, when he cried out with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. Acts chapter 2 confirms the prophecy of David that he didn't go to heaven after he died. He went to uh, Hades, which is where all men go. It makes sense, though, because he was, he was expected by his father to experience the human experience to the letter. So he was conceived miraculously, but nonetheless, from that point, the conception and the, and the pregnancy and the giving of the birth and him being a baby and a toddler and eventually being an adult and all that and dying and being buried, all that was how humans experience it. So it makes sense to me that he would go to the same place that all of us go when we die until the last day, until the judgment. And so, to know that even in death, God holds that, even that, in the palm of His hand. That's a place that you can't even visit. There's not a plane ticket to that. You can't go see this. There's, there's no documentation of it. You, we don't, that's the afterlife. It's the spirit world. But yet it's open before God. Job 34, 21 and 22, For His eyes are on the ways of man, and He sees all His steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Everything... Everything is open before the eyes of the Lord. And it's exactly what Hebrews 4.13 says. There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of, uh, of Him to whom we must give an account. God sees all and knows all. Whether high or low, whether in a physical existence or the spirit realm, God is there. God is there. Jonah understood that. 
Jonah prayed to the Lord in the belly of the fish. He prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Well, God heard him. God was there. You know, no matter where you are and what's going around on around you, like I said, whether it's good or bad, there is nothing, no thing, no place, no event, no experience, no one who can separate you from the love of God as is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. And to know that no matter where you sojourn or wherever you roam or whether you stay at home or whether, no matter what you do, that God is ever present. Now, I got to tell you something. As a child of God, that's very comforting to me. There is great comfort in knowing that God is ever present no matter where I'm at. No matter whether I'm healthy or sick, no matter what. And that He knows us by name. As Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 19, the Lord knows those who are His. He hasn't overlooked you or forgotten you. It's not one of those things, oh Lord, please look down upon me. He's like, oh, uh, what's your name again? And God has an intimate knowledge of who you are. And that He values your soul. Jesus Christ died to save even you and me. And I think that that is why it should weigh very heavy on us. Being We know that God is ever-present. And how comforting that really should be. And perhaps we take it for granted because we just know He's always there. We know that we can pray to Him at any time. And isn't that a wonderful blessing? And we also know, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you, you do know that, well, now if you fall into sin, now you've got to repent. Now, if you have lived long enough to do that, and you know God will, if you're honest and true in your repentance, that God will forgive you. He's heard your prayer and He's ever... And isn't that wonderful to know that even if you should misstep, but yet you do truly repent and you ask God to forgive you, that He's there. Even to that level, there's great comfort in there. I think it should weigh very heavy on us the thought about, about God not being there. And while God is there, He holds the whole world in His hand and while He's ever present all the time, there are some things that will specifically hide Him from you. And sin is the one thing, sin. I mean, that's what the prophet Isaiah has said. And David has mentioned, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, he said. Behold, the Lord's hand is not heavy, it cannot save, nor is ear, or shortened rather, and his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear, is what he says. So there are some things in which we need to realize that in that state, just in that state of death, that as we are there with no effort to, on our part to, to repent, that we are godless. But if we would just repent, He's right there. <laughs> He's right there. He's always been there. You see, the thing that separated us was our sin. He says sin has hidden His face from us like a cloud. I don't know, is it overcast? It seems like it's overcast out there. Would you say it's probably overcast? Did somebody turn the sun down a little bit? Is that what's happening? And you go out there and you know it's up there. You can see the general light behind the cloud. But, you know, the sun is hidden from us. We're hidden from the sun because of clouds. Our sins do that. In that particular case, God will not hear. But here's something else. Think of this to the, to the eternal state. Think of this past this life. All right? If it's true, and it is, if it's true, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, that John says God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And if that be true, what then is outer darkness except the absence of God? Matthew 25 and verse 30, he talks. this is one of a few places he talks about someone who was to be cast into outer darkness where they be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A reference to an eternal hell. No one will be able, I mean, they can, they can try, they can cry out in hell to God, but God will not hear because God is light and He will not dwell where darkness is. And so, if I were to leave you any kind of call to action today, based on what we're saying, is I want you to think really seriously about that. A time in which God will not be there. Right now, it's comforting to know that even, like I said, even if you misstep, but you came to your senses and you repented, He's right there willing to forgive you and help you stand and walk again. But there will come a point where that is no longer available to us. And you are literally without a prayer at that point. So seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6 says, Let the sinner forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord 
and He will have mercy on him. And to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. Take that thought to heart as we open our hymn books to sing the invitation song. And I want to encourage you as we think along these lines to remember the ever-present nature of God, that He sees all, knows all, He's right there. Take advantage of a relationship with God now while you can. And if you will be subject to heaven's call and desire to walk with Him in the light, we hope that you will make it known and come forward right now as we stand and as we sing.